more material, I think, than I uh, can fit in, but we'll try to do it. Um, my name's Martin Brubaker. Um, I uh, was raised in suburban Johnstown, Pennsylvania, but uh, all four of my grandparents and my mother were raised on mountain farms in Somerset County, Pennsylvania, just south of Johnstown. And uh, the grandparents would be one Swiss, of course, two German, and one Scotch-Irish. So that's my background. Um, and um, I'm here because a uh, member of the Brubaker board uh, noticed my name when he was coming through H Hagerstown, Maryland, where I now live, and uh, called me up. And I, I say he dragooned me, but he got me onto the board. And um, uh, I started really catching up on my Brubaker history, which uh, during my career I never had time to do. And um, I've been able to uh, 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 get a lot of information. Uh, um, I've put together a family genealogy that goes back to f the year 1500. There's some weaknesses in there, but th they're pretty good uh, estimates. Um, going to the Brubaker reunions, there's tremendous material available. There are excellent articles about the Brubaker and the Pennsylvania Mennonite Heritage Journal. Brubakers went to Europe in uh, 1985 on a tour. There's another one next year. I highly recommend it. They'll be talking about it tonight. Um, and I used material out of this book. They had several good speakers. And I'll tell you a story about the, the picture in it later. And uh, many documents that I've gathered, going from, ranging from the New York Public Library Genealogy Department to Hagerstown, Maryland, Western uh, Maryland room. And as, as recently as just a few months ago found some fresh stuff. So uh, a lot of good stuff, and uh, let's get started on it. We're going to be talking about 400 years of history covering about three uh, eras of historical development labeled, you can argue whether it's accurate labels, late medieval times, um, the Enlightenment, and in between, sandwiched in between, the Reformation era, of course, of which our ancestors were heavily involved. Um, We're going to focus on the thread of how the Brubakers that came here in 1717 and got several thousand acres, although shared with others, just north of here in Roarstown from William Penn in 1717. And that's why we're here 300 years later. We're going to trace that thread. We're not going to do uh, Anabaptist history. We're not going to do Brubakers in general. We're going to trace that thread of the ones that arrived here and, uh, and we're going to do the European part. So, um, uh, the other uh, material I have is from the trips that my wife and I took in 2014 and 2016. We um, uh, really explored a lot ourselves in the summer of 14. I made a lot of notes, got a lot of data before we went from all these various sources. But... Uh, we were hunting for the origin of our name. Brubakers are Celts. There's good evidence that we were probably were in the Alps 3,000 years ago. Um, but the surname uh, originated uh, 230 years earlier than was presented, 250 years earlier than was presented last night. And the first document that we know of where our name is mentioned is in... Uh, Brapak is in Erlenbach, uh, near Lake Zurich. So I will start with our show, and uh, we'll get underway. This, there's a story behind getting here, and you have to see what it says there. In the place of Brapak, in Brapak, and Brapak Veg, which is Brubaker Way, is the name of the street around that housing development. Um, we had a picture from the Brubaker trip. We didn't have that. We didn't know that was even there. I don't know if it was there in 1985. Looks like a fairly new development. Um, and we, we had a picture, and we knew it was Erlenbach, which it wasn't. It was Harlesburg. But we went in a post office in Erlenbach, a little town about right along Lake Zurich, and we said, kitten mule. It's not on the nav, it's not on the maps, 
We're looking for kitten meal, which is the medieval name in our documents for that area. Postal clerk says, well, wait a minute. Her supervisor's glaring at her. Wait a minute, she says, I think I know. And she Googles it, comes up with something. She says, I know an address. I said, give me an address, I can get there. Sure enough, she, she found kitten meal and got an address there and we were able to put it in the nav. And that's when we got there. We wound up a hill in the foothill. And when I saw that, I knew we were in the right place because if you know Switzerland, they don't approve things lightly that aren't right and right, aren't accurate. That Imbrubach would never have been there if that wasn't the site where the name Brubaker was developed, which was in the year 1335. You know, think about that, 1335. And uh, we have a document where uh, they, um, the Repox had to provide 280 kilos of oats, and say kilos, but that would be a modern thing, to the uh, Grossminster in Zurich every year in turn for having those lands around there. So that, that it was a very emotional moment seeing that sign because we knew we had found it. But that's, this was supposed to be the site of the bridge over the stream. Well, we, you know, we had to find that. So we, um, we looked around. We, we drove down the street and I don't want that. You know, we found the, uh, <laughs> yeah, right, close it. Okay, so we drove down from the housing development. There's this beautiful Stream Valley Park and crossing a road stream and you could see it going down. So we followed it down and we had scenes like that. That's one of them. And we had bridges like that, and we said, nope, doesn't match our picture, plus obviously it's a modern trail bridge, and it's not on a highway or anything. Uh, so, and we walked probably down a kilometer, and then back up the stream valley a kilometer, and we came to another helpful citizen. And she said, what are you doing here? And they speak English, you know? And we said, we told her, told her she let me see the picture. We showed her the picture. This is from my 18, 1985 picture. She looks at it, and she says, Oh, I think I know that tree. And, and there we are. The tree in the background that's leaning, she recognized that tree. And it turns out our car was parked about 100 feet away. And we didn't know it was the bridge, the famous bridge, because, oh, there's kitten mule, see, on the sign. That means mill, and we'll play into that later. Uh, it means sort of a general purpose grinding mill. That's the famous bridge which, as I said this morning, is more like what we call a storm drain today. But it's about eight feet deep there, deeper than it looks. But that road is very convincing as a road that would have existed in medieval times because the mill is right up where it bends around the corner. There's a nice restaurant there you'll see in a minute. And the bridge comes plunging down, I mean the stream comes plunging down underneath and then really plunges. We're only less than two miles from Lake Zurich right here goes down the hill through Erlenbach. So that road would have been built so the wagons with their heavy loads for the mill were on as even great as possible. And so instead of going up the hill in the back, they would have built it around. So you had the easiest lift possible for the load. So it really makes sense to me that that probably was a bridge they had to have because it was deep enough down. Now, uh, again, uh, why there must be a million bridges over streams or more. Why it's stuck with our family, we don't know and we'll probably never will know. But surnames were kind of arbitrary in those days. This is when first surnames were first being established. Many even came later in 1335. And ours might have come earlier. That's just the first document that we have mentioning it. Okay, that's the famous bridge going the other way. <coughs> And that is a very nice restaurant if you go there. And I'm going to hand out a paper that has how to get there. Um, very nice restaurant right next to it and uh, a great place. And it's a great general area. Farms spread out from beyond it. It's sort of the edge, like Millersville and Roarstown used to be separate communities, but now they're just sort of the edge of suburban Lancaster as it spreads. This is the ed south edge, uh, southeast edge of Zurich, literally. 
the housing developments start uh, stop at the, where our, what, what I just showed you, and behind them is this. Uh, without the poles, it could have been 500, 700 years ago, you know, and probably did look like that. Now here, uh, we're, very, uh, we're in back of the Brubaker properties again, going south, and th that ridge you see in the, in the distance is on the far side of Lake Zurich, on the, east, on the west side. Uh, called the left side of Switzerland. Uh, so Lake Zurich is in that dip there, probably about 500 feet down. You just can't see it because it's buried in the glacier. It's actually a glacial uh, ravine, but that's how close we are to Lake Zurich. This is the church site where they, uh, uh, the Brubakers probably worship, but it would have been Roman Catholic, and it's just the site. Of course, that's not the church that would have been there in 1335. But um, uh, good reason to believe that that was a worship site for a long time. And, of course, in 1335, everybody was a Roman Catholic. And the, the Anabaptist uh, and Reformation came later. So uh, a very nice church right up behind the Brubaker properties. It might have even been part. Something I'd like to do now that I have all this time is find the boundaries of that land if it exists somewhere. Very elegant inside. We, we weren't able to talk to people there. We just didn't have time when we were visiting. We, uh, Dan, this, this is really illustrative. Uh, Brubakers lived where I, in the lands I was just showing you. In 1335, in 1525, was the Anabaptist movement. Uh, and a Brubaker was one of the first to be baptized um, under the new uh, uh, regime. And... That, that Brubaker was very active, and that was about 1525 to 1530, and was not martyred. He was in jail, in prison, and some of his contemporaries literally were martyred, but he wasn't. But So a Brubaker was, was right in on the beginning of the Anabaptist movement. Now, some people think all the Brubakers were Anabaptists. No, many Brubakers stayed behind, were part of the so-called establishment, as you might say, and, um, and to this day are there. Uh, although it's, I don't believe the population of Brubakers is nearly as heavy as it would have been back then. Um, uh, around 1552, uh, we have record of a Brubaker baptism in Vaudensville on the left side, the west side of the lake. We're going across at the Milan Horgan Ferry, right in the middle of Lake Zurich. I'd highly recommend it. Here's one reason why. Look at that view. Uh, down Lake Zurich. That's looking you know, down towards the Alps. Uh, Central Alps. So it's a great way to get it on a summer day, get refreshed. And it goes between the two wings of the Brubakers. The founding side and the side where most of the people of Anabaptist persuasion went because for political reasons and various other jurisdictional reasons, they were safer from, we think this is the reason, they were safer from the authorities in Zurich coming and harassing them. So they went to the the far side of the lake, and the first registry we have is at Vodensville, that we have right now. But they really moved into the foothills. This is in the, literally the Vodensville hinterland, not, not suburban, rural. And uh, again, now we're on the other side of the lake, and that ridge in the background is on the far side of the lake. It's right down there in between. And um, so this is where many of our uh, and our direct line came, and we're not sure exactly when our direct line came, but, but it would have been right around this time, and settled in this beautiful uh, area. And every vista I show you here probably, sur we know some for sure survey over Brubaker property, but I would say any of these views, at one time or another, a Brubaker lived down in those valleys. Um, this is another place we had a lot of help from a Swiss citizen who sort of said you aren't really supposed to drive up there, but man, you really can if you don't mind driving on a country lane. And I said, no, I don't mind. I love it. You know, so we, we, we went up a country lane to get to the top of this hillside. And, um, and the view is uh, fantastic. You can see the lake a little bit there. Uh, that's taken with a close-up lens. And uh, that's the kind of lands our ancestors lived in from about the 1550s until the 1640s, when they pretty much, if you were in a Baptist, you probably, you had to get out. 
Um, so 110 years in this beautiful area. It's near Spitzen uh, and Herzl, uh, all behind Vidensville and behind Horgan. And this is the lands we were. Uh, there's Herzl clinging to the hillside, looking Spitzen's down to the left. And uh, uh, another piece of information I, uh, from looking at documents, most descriptions say that Peter Brugbacher, which I'll get to in a minute, he's going to be our most important person, lived in Spitzen to the left. But really, the documents from his kids many decades later said Stocken. I found Stocken on a modern map. It's over closer to the, to the lake, looking out over that area I was just showing you. So there's some really interesting stuff when you start doing this. There's never enough time to pursue it, and never enough time over there to look at primary documents and all that. Um, now, we, we've, we've gone up the road a bit, uh, about, uh, I'm going to say about 10 kilometers, about eight, seven or eight miles. Um, and we're on Brubacher Strasse, you can see there. And um, at the top of Brubacher Strasse, we're down in a, like a level spot, is the village, the Brubacher, uh, the hamlet of Brubacher. And that looks just like any American Brubacher settlement, as you can see. Yeah. And, uh, but, but actually, uh, I'm talking to uh, a Brubaker that was there uh, uh, about 10 years ago, and he said he could not find any Brubakers there. We tried to talk to people, but one of the few places we didn't run into English speakers during a business day, though, we didn't run into anybody young. And it's been a nice town. So it's, you can see Brubaker on the fence. Can you see it on the fence post? I mean, on the fence rail. Uh, so, and here's the view from Brubhacher. That's uh, Horgan down below. The, uh, that's the direction where the ferry is. Vodensville is over to the right, to the south. Uh, but it's all the hinterland where Brubakers were. So, uh, I think if you had to go and see where the, the, the predominantly the, where Brubakers lived, the area around Sp uh, Spitzen and Herzl is the area to go. And again, I have a handout that shows that. Um, so I just wanted to talk about Peter Brugbacher for a moment. I think he's the most important character in the narrative of how most of us in this room got to be here. Um, Peter Brugbacher was, uh, we pretty much know who his parents were, have a good idea. That's when I said we can go back to 1500. Um, and, and that probably means he, his grandparents may have been born on, on the far side of the lake. Uh, he was uh, uh, an Anabaptist of strong conviction that had apparently built up a very valuable uh, property um, in that area that we were looking at in that Stockton community, um, which is uh, really a, ham a hamlet like Brubacher Br was. Peter Brubacher was arrested uh, when there was military, this was the middle of the Thirty Years' War, and when there was military pressure on Switzerland, the Anabaptists tended to get persecuted more because, you know, they didn't want to serve in the military and they didn't want to take an oath of allegiance to the government. And the government was more antsy and nervous about military preparations, and it just tended to be a, a vicious circle. Um, so Peter was arrested and put in jail in Vidensville for not doing various civil duties. And um, he uh, escaped or got out. And then they put him in jail up in Zurich, the really serious prison. That's the prison where they drowned people and various other things uh, earlier on. And they had just done it just 20 years before. Um, so he lost his beautiful estate eventually in that area. Um, but he uh, had three sons. So let's go to Zurich, where the serious stuff is happening. This is a walkway south of the railway station in downtown Zurich. And again, the Brubaker tour didn't see this because it wasn't there then. Uh, they did it, I believe, about 20 years ago. Right here is a memorial stone to the martyrs. This is where they threw them in the river. That's how they, they threw them in the river. And uh, it was a very rainy day. And I, I have apologized for the picture, but you have to go there and see it for yourself. And um, 
uh, it's, it, it, it would be part of a beautiful walk around Zurich. Ours wasn't so beautiful because it was raining all the time, but um, that's the view from where we were, that monument is, up the river. Um, and uh, there's the Grossmünster, the major Protestant church in the background. And that's the, looking down the river the other way towards the railway crossing. Now this is good. This is right above the Martyr uh, uh, Memorial. And that's where the Othenbach prison was. And that's where they kept people, prior, uh, like Peter Brubacher, they kept him for almost a year before, uh, well, we'll get into that. Um, and, but it's also where they kept people that were condemned. And it was up on that hillside. As a matter of fact, the guy that pointed out the, where the marker was, the memorial, um, I asked him where a men's room was. And he said, up in the park, up in the top of the hill. So I went up this very long staircase. And when I came back down, for some reason, I mentioned the prison. And he said, oh, it's not there anymore. It was up on top of the hill, right where you were. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I guess I did what was appropriate for where the prison was. But, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, so that's where the prison was, right above, very convenient. They just took them down to the river. And I'm being a little, you know, it's a serious subject. But it's, it, those were different times. Um, and uh, let's see, what's the next one? No, let's not go there yet. Here's what's about his children. And this is a good one to illustrate that, too. So he had three children by his second wife. His, when they started harassing him, she died. Um, so he had these preteen children. And when they put him in prison, they made a huge point of take, seizing the children, not just his property putting them in a, a, what we call a reform school or something today, in adjacent or in the prison. We don't know quite what, but they said at Otenbach. They weren't prisoners exactly, but they were, you know, given a rudimentary education and they were then, then uh, taught a trade because, you know, the Mennonites were very successful farmers and they wanted them to learn trade so they didn't do this farm stuff and so they got the... They made them get baptized in the Swiss Reformed Church and go through all that, all that uh, sort of thing. And, uh, uh, and they took money from the confiscated estate to pay for the children's uh, education and room and board and so on and so forth. So, um, so the children were there, but instead of turning them into successful, prosperous, bourgeois uh, Swiss citizens, when the father... Now we'll pick up on the father, Peter, again, the one I say is our key person. He got out. We don't know. Some say he escaped. Some say there's no evidence of a release paper. There's evidence that they looked for him after he was out. Um, nobody quite knows how that happened, but, but 40, he was arrested in 1637. 1638, he was out, and he turned up in Alsace, Alsace in France, it's now France, it wasn't France then, uh, outside of Switzerland. Um, and he was in Mackenheim, which we'll get to, um, and then his sister was in Jebsheim, and the children, now growing up, as soon as they got a little bit of freedom, guess where they went? Joined their father. So all the things to inculcate them, indoctrinate them, and bring them into the Swiss, they went to join the father, and those children were the progenitors of our, the three people that got land grants up right up here in Norristown. Uh, so, and got plenty of time. Uh, so this is the rest of uh, just a few shots of downtown Zurich. We took a walk around to get the flavor of it. There's stories, of course, with all these buildings. This is where he escaped to. This is. Uh, a few hundred kilometers up the river from, uh, from Zurich and outside of uh, up the river and then up into what's now Alsace. Uh, this is between Strasbourg, which many of you have heard of, and Colmar, little village. And Mackenheim is in the documents. It's hard to find, a little hard to find. We didn't have time to go to Jebsheim, but we think it was even smaller than Mackenheim. Um, we asked uh, around. Nobody knew about any Brubaker things, but there was... We asked, well, where's the oldest building? And so they, they put us there, they showed us that. And I said, not the most dilapidated, the oldest, you know. <laughs> but anyhow, we had a good time in Mackintyre. And now I could, I could 
practice my high school French because we were in France now. And uh, this, this is France these days. Excuse me, and that was my, uh, my language that I learned. So uh, I went in and tried to practice my French. We had been in France once before, but not to here. And uh, they laughed at me. This is, this is the only business in town, as far as we know. It's like a pub. We call it a French pub. You know, it was like a walk-in French pub. And uh, they laughed. I, I tried to do the French. But they're all good-natured about it. They like you to try. And uh, so it was, a, it was a nice change of pace. You know, they say eat local. That's what we did. And um, so we, we did go to Strasbourg. I highly recommend going to Strasbourg. Huge, beautiful town to see. And the next day we were in uh, Verms, and actually we were near Verms uh, to start. And this is where, so, so uh, Peter Brabacher was in Alsace from uh, 1638. There's an indefinite period there. Nobody quite knows where he was for a while, but he turns up in Mackenheim. And then in 1661, he comes another uh, 100 and some kilometers north to Ibersheim, the name at the bottom under Worms. It's now part of the city of Worms and is part of our modern suburbanization. It was way outside of Worms back in that, those times, and now it's the northern city limits of Worms. So things changed pretty fast. And so this is Ibersheim, and this is where they came from, Ibersheim actually. From there is where they came to. Uh, Pennsylvania. And this is the main street in Eversheim, but we learned very quickly to look in the back streets. We didn't have any maps about where things were, and there in the back street, driving the back street, there's what we came across. So we knew we were in a place where Anabaptists still lived, still lived. And uh, when we saw that sign on the back street, and there is their very nice church, Built in 1836, uh, there were uh, these communities were strictly controlled. They had to sign contracts with the Elector of Palestine, the leader, the Governor of Palestine, Palatine, excuse me, the Palatine. And the, the, the contracts were very limited about what Anabaptists could do. They couldn't associate with outside, with the regular German citizens. They they were only allowed to meet with only so many people. Twenty people at a time was the most. They had all kinds of restrictions on their living conditions. And they had to pay so much, you know, to use to make the land profitable again. The reason they were welcomed in Alsace and welcomed here where they had been persecuted a hundred years before is the Thirty Years' War had done such horrible damage in the area that the, the, the princes wanted productive people to build them back up, you know, to make the land uh, productive again. And they knew these were pr uh, very productive people. So they, uh, they, they, but, but they were never fully citizens. They, were, they had all these restrictions. The Ebersheim congregation got to the elector before other Anabaptists. They had the best contract. They had the least restrictions. Uh, some of the elector's advisors got to him and said he needed to tighten up. So the people that came to other hamlets around later generally had uh, more restrictions. It's kind of a neat community, and as you'll see, uh, th this is a little part, so part of the water system there behind our, that's the Puget we were driving around. Now, that's Ebersheim in the background, and, and you'll see in a minute the cars parked right by the Rhine River. That's the Rhine. It's, Ebersheim is right on the Rhine, and those fields were probably, I'll bet, were worked by our ancestors. Because, you know, in Europe, people often live in the village and work the fields around them. So we drove down the road. I don't know if we were supposed to, but the second or third time we did, so what the heck. And we parked, I got as close to the Rhine as I could without going into a ditch. But it was really neat watching the boats go up and down the Rhine there. And then Ebersheim turned out to have a lot of interesting uh, homes, structures. There's a, uh, went past code in Lancaster today, but uh, you know. And, and that, this one here, that could be in Lancaster. You could repeat that scene here, you know. This is uh, some event prominent in the area in 1469. Somebody told me what it was. They're not here. We didn't have anybody taking us around. We just found this stuff. 
Uh, but somebody later on told me, but I do not have the story of what it is. I would have said loaves and fishes, but that guy on the left does not have a loaf in his hand. Okay. But, that, you know, it's nice that they care about the properties in that town that much to have all this symbolic stuff. And I think that was a preschool of some kind. And then uh, that's not the teacher, that's my wife. <laughs> Although she is a preschool teacher. But that's the road to Verm. So really, it's still countryside, I, I, it, but they've incorporated it into the city. So it's not really totally uh, suburbanized. And now we're back to what really, uh, what Verms is probably most famous for in the greater world, and then Martin Luther. And this is the park right near the cathedral where he told the Pope that, you know, here I stand, I can do no other. And uh, uh, his famous thing, and he had to be hidden away for two years after uh, coming here. They had to kidnap him out of town. And, um, but this is, uh, but there's no Anabaptists there, though. They, the Protestants didn't like the Anabaptists either. So, uh, and that's the church, uh, the Martin Luther's persecution. That's the, that church was there, and the persecution was in like a hearing room right behind it. And you see the difference between the Swiss church that we just saw a while ago up behind the Brubaker property and what churches had become by then. I'm not going to make a value judgment, just a very different world. Now, um, this is the village of Albesheim. Uh, this is another place that I had made a note to try and see, and we got out there. These places can be a little hard to find, um, but we got there, and we, on this one we drove the back streets, but we didn't see any um, uh, uh, Mennonite evidence, uh, Anabaptist evidence, and sort of shrugged, because we had one place just beyond it to try called Weierhof. Some of you may have heard of that. Boy, that's like kitten mule. It's on a modern map. You can't find it, you know. It was really difficult to find, but we drove in the vicinity, and we saw a sign, and that took us right in. Um, you see they're growing wine up here, or growing uh, grapes, growing vineyards. Uh, down below, it was general crops, the time. This, we, we went to Vierhof, Ver and we drove in. We drove the back street routine. And right there, that is the, oh, I don't know, the Sunday school church building of, of an uh, Anabaptist church. And we met the minister, and we got to talk, and the minister says, wait a minute, there's somebody I want you to meet. We said, okay, okay. So he sends a kid off to go find these people. In the meantime, you know, we're looking at and talking to him about the, what happened there and on, so on and so forth. The young guy, he was about to have a, a youth group meet in that building, so we didn't have too much time with him. So these are the people that the young kid brings to meet us. The lady on the left is, as far as I know, the, uh, it, well, I, I do know, because we, we got there, uh, we, we exchanged family trees and everything with him. She is a Brupphocker, still there, and uh, she was, grew up in Albusheim, that town that we were just back at. And her ancestor was Peter, uh, Peter's son, Peter. And Hans Heinrich and Hans Jacob, they were the ones that went with him to Ibersheim. And Peter, for whatever reason, youngest kid, whatever, went to the Albusheim area and Weierhof eventually. The church is in Weierhof. They lived in Albusheim. She is a survivor of that family. She said their family's been there forever. And of course, uh, a year later, I got a family tree from them. This is typical. She said, I don't know. My, my grandson has the family tree down in uh, Langnau or someplace. You know, it's a real interesting story because who would have the CD with the family tree on? The kids. So uh, very nice, very gracious people. They didn't have a lot of English, the, uh, but the pastor translated pretty well for us. So uh, we went around and we were taken around actually here to see their church. Again, very nice. 1837. I think there was a change in the law to investigate that in Germany because it's too coincidental that the, the, the 1836 in Ebersheim and 1837 in, in um, uh, uh, Weierhof. And Weierhof's about, I'm going to say, about 15 or 20 miles from, uh, from Ebersheim. It's inland towards the foothills. 
a very nice church again. These are other buildings in, in Weyerhof, all interesting. A lot of great graveyards in Europe. This is a building where they met before their permanent, this is where they met before they had a chapel, before they had a church. One of the rules was they often couldn't have churches. They had to meet in homes and uh, other buildings. There's Kreimbuehl, another Mennonite name. And uh, Mennonite, you mind, that means uh, the Mennonite neighborhood, locality, whatever. And then about 1710, William Penn had been soliciting up and down the Rhine, personally, actually, about coming to this new colony of Pennsylvania. And since the Thirty Years' War, Louis XIV had been busy from France, had been busy trying to take that over for France instead of uh, the Württemberg dynasty of, of, uh, of Germany. And uh, so Louis XIV, had, his generals had been what we now call scorched earth tactics. They didn't do a lot of that in those days, believe it or not. But the Thirty Years' War had been ugly, and, and, and Louis XIV was particularly vindictive against this area. So I would say between all those things and the promise of what in Pennsylvania of William Penn and probably some early Mennonites that went in 1710, the, um, the promises uh, over here seem too great. And, but we don't have a firm record of them departing here because we looked here for records. You know what they told us? They said, we have terrible records because nobody wanted to write anything down. If the authorities had ever wanted to crack down on us, they would have lists. So we didn't make lists. We didn't put registries of people. Yeah. Um, so 1717, they would have had to go down the Rhine to Rotterdam, and uh, that's going down the Rhine. Uh, we took a scheduled German ferry boat. We didn't take Viking cruise or anything like that. We took a scheduled German ferry boat. It was great, very comfortable. Uh, we met a lot of great people. It was really cheap and really comfortable, clean and comfortable. And it dropped you off if you, whatever town you wanted to stay at for that night. You got back on, back on the next day without paying any more fare. You know, you just bought a, we bought a ticket from Mance to Cologne. So I would highly recommend that. It was like 80 euros or something. And that's hundreds of miles, you know. There was, and we, we, we could get off and stay for a couple of days and get back on, you know. Just, it was a really great system. Much more flexible than riding around on somebody's luxury liner. Uh, three years ago. Really? Mm -hmm. That's 2014. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was great. And they only run about twice a day, each direction. Um, but those are some of the famous steep vineyards on the Rhine. And I, they would have seen the same thing. They did that back then. The Romans started this. Romans started those vineyards. So I won't show you pictures of the Rhine or we could go on forever. But um, uh, I do want to say that there's uh, uh, that I have a handout here that has the. Um, my wife should, said I should end it with more punch, but I, I kind I find it kind of uh, uh, sad in a way that they've had to leave all these areas that they build up, make prosperous, and then they have to get out of Dodge. But here they are in Pennsylvania, all 300 years later. So it seemed like it worked pretty well. Um, but I, I don't have, it was good for them. They probably went to Rotterdam at the end of the, or, and, but, oh, I know what I wanted to, to tell you. Later on, you'll, you'll see, or you might look, you'll see ship lists with lists of, of people coming in, immigrants. They didn't have those ship lists until the 1720s. When our ancestors arrived in 1717 and earlier, they, they didn't have formal lists. They had arriving ships, and we know some ships came in with Mennonites in 1710 and 1717. And I've seen various books and various sources say the Brubakers came in 1710, and some say 1717. We don't know for sure, but we do know they got the land grant in 1717, so it's most likely that that's when they came. That's also when the largest uh, con second contingent came over. So. Uh, uh, the other, the other missing link, the other uh, problem is, and, and again, I'll leave you. Between Peter Brugbacher 
and his sons coming, his sons were, uh, would have been having children in the 1640s and 50s and maybe 60s, but that means there had to be one or maybe even two generations before the 1717 generation came over. We have no records. And we walked around with the current um, major domo of Ebersheim, and he said that they didn't have that sort of thing for the problems I mentioned. And because, again, there's always been a lot of war damage in that area also. But, but uh, so I don't know whether they don't have them or don't want to talk about it. I, I did find a source myself most recently uh, in, the, in, in, in Hagerstown, actually. Um, I found a 1709 petition to the elector, governor of Palatine, saying, uh, talking about their complaints and all that, signed by Hans Brubacher. And two Hans Brubachers came over, either in 1710 or 1717. The source I got it from has about eight or nine Brubaker references up until 1710 that signed various documents. I got those two. Um, and after 1710, nothing. So, you know, it's pretty sure. Brubakers were pretty active. And, and, and Weyerhoff, they signed one of the founding contractors, contracts, excuse me, with the, with the elector. So our name appears a lot. You know, that's one reason we can follow a lot of this. Um, so, but there's those two or three missing generations, and I love to do that. And I thought last fall we went back over. Uh, the president of, of, of the Brubaker board and I have, boy, our, we're, we're seven or nine generations apart. My ancestors left Lancaster in 1790, but we, our DNA is almost a perfect match. Isn't that amazing? It's seven, all those generations, you know. So uh, uh, we went over with our wives, both Pam, and uh, look, went to some of the sites and talked to uh, archivists and historians. And I have, we, uh, we have some leads but, there, but we haven't uh, had a chance to uh, really follow through as much as, uh, as we can. Again, it's bit by bit, slow process, things show up. So, so that's where we are with that. And again, I started to tell you, I have a handout here. And it has, it's a, just a one pager. And if you're interested in ever going yourself or doing Google Earth or having your grandchildren do Google Earth for you, um, this has the address where the kitten mule is, where our name began. It's, so all you've got to do is put it in your Google Earth, or if you're over there driving, just put it in your nav. It's got the, uh, the, the corners where some of the sites are, streets and so forth. So you can you know, find your way, or at least get started finding your way. Yes, sir? When were the locks put in on the uh, mine, and do you know where in Rotterdam uh, I have a pretty good idea where in Rotterdam, uh, but I don't, but I, <laughs> uh, they have, they have, and actually I was in Holland that same, in this, the trip two years ago, three years ago now, uh, I was in, we, we were near Rotterdam, we were in Leiden, um, but we just, we had to cut and we didn't have time to get into Rotterdam, we got into Amsterdam, we had to choose. But I was told, though, that they've restored the dock where the Ameri ships for America left. But we never saw it. So I would check. I would Google it. There's a place. So they think they have a place. Now, you, we can't say that our ships left, but they said it's, it's the tradition. That's where the ships for America left back in the day. And, of course, you know, Rotterdam was totally wiped out by, by, by the Nazis in, in 1940. So... Uh, but they've restored that. So, and the locks, I, I really don't know. It's spectacular, though. I mean, we, I've, I've had, uh, we have friends in Basel at the other end of the river that were part of our sister city. And you, you, you can eat at a restaurant, and there's a ship going by right over you, you know, almost. You know, the way they have the, the, the way it canalized and all that. And if, when, when you're in the Netherlands, they have giant ship passageways right over top the highway. You know, things like that. It's just kind of amazing. Um, so I have the references. I have, uh, oh, well, you don't want to see this. Just to show you, I'm not strictly a nav guy. This is the Zurich page for my Michelin Atlas. <laughs> <laughs> and find another thing I want to leave you with. I got a couple minutes here. So they're probably waving something at me somewhere. Um, I wanted to talk just real briefly. I meant to bring this in earlier, another stage. Brubakers did stay behind in Switzerland, 
And a number of years ago, I was in New York, and I had some time, and I, was, I had to do some research at the, uh, gene at the library there. And I went to the genealogy department, and they had a lexicon of famous names in Switzerland from 1924. And there, and I, of course, I turned to the Brubaker page. And by the way, their, their capsule description of the Brubaker fits most of that info. This is 1924, you just heard. So it's always good to see everything correlated. Um, but we had, uh, uh, these are noted people. Uh, we had a stonecutter, uh, and they're from Vodensville, and from Luzerne, and from Zurich. And we had a professor, we had a lithographer. These are all very well-known people at their skills. I know that they had very famous metal craftsmen that were brew bakers from Vodensville, which you might remember is where we landed on the other side of the lake. Uh, but here's what I, I got a big kick out of. Um, because I was in elected office for a little bit, and it, it says uh, Fr Fritz Brubaker, born 1874, this is a uh, physician in uh, Osterhill, I think that's near Zurich, city council, 1901-1904, member of the Poor and Students Administration. Well, so far, okay, right? Okay. <laughs> then it goes on. Well-known communist and anarchist, <laughs> publisher of the Young Switzerland and numerous brochures since 1905, Carried out propaganda for anti-militarism, direct action, general strike, etc. Contributed to German, French, Italian, and Russian revolutionary and anarchist syndicalist newspapers. How's that? Not many of us do that stuff. Huh? <laughs> I thought that was a that was a hoot. So I, I I'm sorry I had to pick up a couple threads there at the end. And like I said, uh, I'll leave this. I'll leave these here uh, if anybody, they're just one pagers and they've got, you know, some of the key information about the sites we talked about. Thank you.